Okay, so thank you everyone for, for joining. We will start uh, the, the session. Um, and in this session, we really we're really going to return to um, a topic that was uh, introduced yesterday, yesterday morning, which is really about uh, dealing with, uh, with the SDGs as an integrated set, uh, as an in uh, a set of interdependent goals, and what sort of tensions and uh, opportunities um, arise, uh, arise from that in terms of accelerating and transformation towards uh, sustainability. So in this session, we're going to be more concrete in terms of the, uh, the initiatives, the projects that are ongoing uh, in, in this space to, uh, to make some headway in terms of bringing, uh, bringing the SDG into the, the policy space. So three years after the, the adoption of the SDGs, actually there is, there is a lot uh, going on uh, in countries. There are institutional mechanisms across governments being put in place in a number of countries. Um, usually in the, the le leadership of the, the head of government of a very high level, like in Japan or Colombia. We're seeing countries that are taking uh, steps towards um, reviewing their, their, their sustainable development strategy, like in Germany, where Helen Clark actually led a, an international review process of the Germany a sustainable development strategy with a view of strengthening the, the stakeholder engagement and the, the, the parliamentary engagement in the in, in this, uh, Ireland, France, and other countries are, are moving towards mapping their their activities and and current plans onto uh, onto the SDGs. And we're also seeing moves in terms of bringing the SDGs into budgetary processes at national level. So there's lots going on, but also challenges remain uh, in terms of implementation, translation into into act actual policies, policy change and action on the ground and is still slow. And in terms of what the implementation challenges are, we're going to touch on two of those in, in this session. The first one is, is the integration challenge, is the breadth of the agenda. How do you keep the agenda? How do you stay true to the, the spirit of the SDGs, as it were, in terms of um, integrating the planetary and the human development agenda um, and keeping that as a whole as we move towards um, implementation, prioritization, monitoring. And the second one is really, how do we make sense of the SDGs at, uh, at the national level? How do we uh, bring that UN agenda uh, and, and make it um, relevant to, uh, to policy process uh, in, uh, in countries? So this is really the, the, the sort of core of the issues we're going to touch on with, um, with the panel. So has it been the practice in the conference? We'll, uh, we'll first hear from the, each of the panelists and we'll ask you to uh, n write down your question, comments, thoughts, uh, because we want to hear also from you and your own experience in, in, uh, in this space. Um, and we'll take a, a discussion uh, after, after the presentations. So without um, further ado, I'm going to hand over to Sir Peter. You do, don't need uh, any more introduction at this point. Um, <laughs> um, Peter, over to you. Thank you. What I'm going to do is very quickly and very rapidly uh, describe to you the logic behind and then give you a very superficial outline of a project that has been jointly developed primarily by INSA and jointly with the International Science Council. The, the impetus for it comes from actually from Anne Sophie, our chair, so I feel that she should be giving the talk, not me. And I think the real issue is at the level of the nation state, are the SDGs actually have any value or uh, any utilitarian value or not? Because at the heart of the process, while there are multiple stakeholders in the SDGs, if governments don't actually commit to policy development around them, it's difficult to see how it, they will really have the impact on national development that they should. And then the issue is, secondly, whether they are really just an aspirational set of goals or whether they actually can be a toolkit for driving progress. And this is an important difference because if they're just aspirational, countries will just repackage what they're already going to do and say they're meeting 
towards the objectives of the SDGs. And I think many countries have adopted that approach. Whereas the real desire would be that the SDGs are seen to be important enough to actually impact on the policy process itself. And if you think about the distinction between science for policy and policy for science, you can also think about the issues of whether the same analogy applies to science for, for policy for the SDGs and, and science to implement policy driven uh, related to the SDGs. And what, while I think the kind of work that we heard yesterday from our Japanese colleagues on roadmap development is very much designed to how to use STI to implement the SDGs, the question that we've raised through ISC and INSA is can they be used, can evidence be used to drive the policy process that shapes and frames how a government responds to the SDG challenge? And the reality is this, that governments don't organise themselves around the SDGs. There's not a minister for SDG 3 and a minister for SDG 4 and a minister for SDG 5. The goals, targets and indicators do not necessarily match the national priorities or the political process. They were not developed because of the way they were developed with, with public policy making as the main driver, and yet public policy is a critical element. Nation states have other frameworks, as we heard yesterday from Helen Clark, that drive their policy framework. And at the level of finance ministries, the most important ministries, of course, it's those other frameworks that drive policy makers. Equally, at the political level, governments want to be seen to respond to their citizens rather than to a UN directive. Thus, to have any kind of policy impact, the SDGs need to somehow be linked between these realities and the current SDG framework. Discussion. Discussion. Oh, now I've lost everything. <laughs> what do we do then? You. Aha. Now we're at the back of it. You've seen all my talk now. Um, um, discussion was... We've had lots of discussion with politicians... Treasury officials, policy makers in both high income and low income countries, and they confirm these issues. And they were looking and have been seeking a way to link their frameworks to the SDGs that, se that reflect their needs. They also, which is summarised on this slide. So the starting point for the, for the project that's just getting off the ground is using ex international analysis, which is work which Anne Sophie led on behalf of International Council of Science a couple of years ago. And that is to realise that if one understand, because the 169 targets, the 17 goals, all interplay in different ways, if one doesn't understand the interactions, one cannot see how to play it into the policy process. And so what and Sophie and her colleagues did was to map four of the SDGs and some of the interactions. And they demonstrated that they can be synergistic and, and countervailing, uh, counterproductive interactions between some of the SDG targets. And they worked out a grading system, or they used a grading system developed by Swedish colleagues uh, and, and Swedish and German colleagues, as shown here, where you can rate an interaction between any SDG target and another SDG target on a scale of minus three to plus three. And these interactions matter because it's where much policy making happen, happens. It's where policy risk and benefit can be better understood. It's where, it, it's where government agencies operate. They can inform the, pub, the policy maker of where priorities lie and where within a map of interactions priorities could be identified. They illustrate the trade-offs and spillover effects which effectively underpin every political decision in public policy. And so what we've proposed, and several countries have been interested in piloting, is where we ask a group of scientists, a group of civil society, a group of policy makers, 
to weight the interactions. Now, the problem is there's actually about 20,000 possible interactions between 169 targets. In fact, that can be exp needs to be expanded because the SDGs do not cover all the issues that a government needs, and therefore you need to create some dummy targets that cover the issues that a, a treasury or a government is interested in but are not encompassed in the SDGs. The, the once, though, once, so what we've decided is from the 20,000 interactions, theoretical interactions, you can reduce it to about 500 to 1,000 in context which are likely to be significant. But the ones that will be significant will be context specific. For example, a country like Kenya will have relatively little engagement with SDG 14, that's the marine uh, uh, SDG, whereas a country like Samoa will clearly see that as a very important SDG. What will be done then is from those thousand interaction, uh, possible interactions for that country, we will ask different constituencies, and in the first place in the pilot, just academics and policy makers, to weight the interactions. And we're currently building uh, an electronic toolkit so this can be done electronically. That will then lead to an interaction analysis using at least second order interactions as well as first order interactions, which will allow a network map. If you think of a, those of you who've seen a gene pathway, imagine a network map where you see the critical nodes where the interactions between different of the SDG targets and dummy targets identify where you could have the most bang for your buck, the most impact on the system. Clearly, what is rated as interaction nodes that matter may in the first instance be different between scientists and policy makers. And that is the whole point of the exercise, to actually start a reconciliation, an iterative process. The toolkit creates an opportunity for the knowledge community and the policy community to work together to understand what those differences are and why they exist and see whether they can be reconciled. That leads ultimately in an iteration to the policy community rescoring it and then judging uh, where the interactions are identified, major interaction nodes are identified, prioritizing them for action. And the most likely first action is indeed to feed into the kinds of roadmaps which, which Otaki-san, I think, is going to be talking about because this is the necessary prelude as we talked about yesterday, not, not everything is possible and therefore one needs to have some way of prioritising. The other thing it can do, which has attracted a number of treasuries to be very interested, is it can allow modelling. What happens if we put money in here? What happens if we focus here or there? What will we achieve? And so where we're at is we now have a number of countries that are interested in being pilot countries. UNDP, along with the International Science Council, has funded the work and we're hoping to have the toolkit in a position to be road tested, beta tested by, by, by about March next year. We hope to have two countries in the developing world and one country in the developed world pilot this in time for the high level political forum next year. And if that then works, then we will obviously uh, fine tune it and then make it available on an open basis to those countries that want it. And INGS is prepared, along with the IESC, to provide the training and the facilitation so that this, to this toolkit can be taken up. It has broader implications if you think about it. It could have a role with major multinational companies, uh, other companies that are interested in their own strategies, but our focus at this stage is getting to the stage where governments can see a way of understanding how they can connect the bottom-up issues in their country to the SDGs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. So it's very much about developing a, a framework, a common language around how do we start unpacking the, the interactions. Uh, but it's also in, in early work we've, we've done on this is the value of the process in, in 
uh, structuring a conversation and bringing uh, scientists and experts from across a range of SDG domain is, is really where, where the value of that kind of exercise lie uh, beyond uh, the, the identification of, of, the, um, of the nodes. We're going to move on to Professor Otake, visiting professor of policy alternative research at the University of Tokyo and a fellow in the Center for R&D Strategy of JST. Professor Otake. Thank you very much uh, uh, for your uh, kind introduction. And uh, uh, it's the second day, and uh, after Sir Peter's address, it is not so good for me because so many people talking about SDG and uh, uh, maybe good, not so many things to, left, to be left to speak for me. <laughs> That's too bad. So, uh, but uh, I try to, uh, yes, uh, introduce some of the uh, Japanese uh, probably trials or struggle uh, to how to uh, uh, implement SDG. So, uh, this is uh, now uh, we share that uh, as uh, Sir Peter and other uh, speakers said that uh, uh, this uh, SDG is a very holistic, that's good part, but very complex. So even uh, 70 goals and uh, 169 targets are not independent of each other, but interlinked. And also 20, uh, 232 indicators are incompleted. Only probably one third or uh, half of the indicators are a good uh, background of statistics up to now. So we have to uh, develop something. And also, um, the achieving of uh, specific goals may influence, as Peter said, synergies and trade-offs. So minimize the trade-off and uh, maximize the synergy is important. So I uh, joined the discussion of uh, SDG uh, in the uh, UN for uh, uh, two years or three years. And, uh, uh, but still, we have a gap between SDG, SDI, and policy. Uh, because the SDGs are so societal and holistic, but policy are uh, systematically formulated before appearance of SDG. And there was also STI may be a, only a part of the national policy or so. However, now uh, we uh, uh, learned that the SDG require the STI to play a key role to go be overwhelm or go beyond the planetary boundary we face and uh, probably uh, uh, also national policy to cope with these global issues. Now uh, we have to uh, bridge SDG policy and STI. Probably mapping is important. How to bridge? By mapping, I think. First, policy need timeline to imp implement. So this is road mapping. Yesterday, uh, my uh, former boss, uh, Nakamura-san, uh, described the effort of uh, road mapping, and that is uh, one part. And second one is that uh, action mapping. And uh, probably it should be done by government level and organization. I uh, tell you uh, later in, uh, in, the, in this uh, uh, presentation. And also systematic mapping of interlinkage of our common goals and targets. Yes, uh, Sir Peter introduced ISC, nowadays ISC English study, but it's a toolkit is important. And also in Japan, our non-profit owners, I just uh, uh, made some kit and uh, developing still, so uh, you can have uh, uh, some information from IGES homepage. And finally, what is coming next? Scoping is always important. So Japanese case, yes, as uh, Nakamura-san uh, uh, spoke yesterday, that uh, government established SDG headquarters led by Prime Minister in 2016, and policy, regarding policy, headquarters summarize guideline, guiding principle and action plan. That's great. And STI, regarding STI, our supreme uh, uh, advisory body to the prime minister, so-called CSTI, is now heavily involved in the headquarter. And road mapping under construction for national and in collaboration for international. And action mapping in trial phases. So this is the... Yes, uh, structure. Here exists the uh, Prime Minister there and uh, uh, SDG Promotion Headquarter and Council of Science uh, and Te Science, Technology and Innovation linked together and uh, uh, necessary promotion of uh, science 
for SDG, not SDG for science. <laughs> and this is a, probably, this is just shown the image and the tentative, and uh, I, will, uh, uh, I will use it just eyes only because this is uh, not authorized. But you can imagine this uh, prior work uh, shows what kind of effort our government uh, uh, did for the SDGs uh, by using the budget uh, scale or so. But this will be uh, further uh, investigated uh, throughout the process, I think. But in addition to that, quite important point is that both, ah, and in addition to that, I have to show that, uh, I forget to show you, but uh, you can see this kind of book in a web page. Now there's too bulky to have a printed material, but uh, this shows some uh, Japanese, oh, sorry, uh, Japanese uh, yeah. trial of uh, SDGs, not only government, but uh, university or, or uh, other organization. But the important point, the bottom up trial, Individual institutes have to be implement various projects related to SDG. But the problem is that uh, for, I show you the case of the University of Tokyo and Okayama University. They sorting their activity by uh, relating goals. That uh, trial quite quite important for uh, make facility members become aware of SDG first and stimulating further collaboration among facul faculty members then uh, promoting other to collaborate with faculty members like private university partnership, and then probably new ideas make uh, created in uh, new collaboration. So show you something. Yes, uh, in University uh, Tokyo case, this is coming from the home page here, so you can uh, uh, see it in the home page. But uh, they create the University of Tokyo Future Society Initiative, and they sorted out this kind of a lot of projects. Almost, almost 200 uh, projects. How to relate to the SDG? You can s see very uh, s a small uh, number, but uh, this is the so-called SDG uh, number. So, uh, about 20, uh, 200 projects are sorted and categorized. Can be uh, done by goals, fac 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 uh, faculties, and etc. Also, in uh, Okayama University, we saw some <laughs> famous face here. But this is from the Okayama University homepage. But they are uh, promoting S Okayama University both, uh, multiplied by SDGs. And uh, also, they try to sort, sort it out for the time being, some uh, 40 uh, projects, but uh, uh, categorized in the, uh, uh, in the SDG goals or so. And 636 projects are sorted. And identify synergy. No, no more explanation uh, necessary because uh, uh, Sir uh, Peter already explained. But uh, how to make understand clearer synergy and the uh, uh, trade-off may uh, be, uh, may come to be visible. And uh, uh, I show a little bit about our uh, non-profit organization, IGES pro, uh, uh, program. So you can see uh, some uh, information from IGES launch of the IGES SDG interlinkage analysis. It's a quite uh, uh, common, similar to the uh, uh, X, uh, 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 oh, sorry, ISC INSA trial, but uh, they have already chosen nine countries around Asia and uh, uh, what kind of link, synergy or trade-off uh, happened in the individual, uh, between the goal uh, targets. And, uh, and one more thing is that this one, yes. What I would like to do is that, uh, I would like to say is that we uh, expect good tools developed. So uh, probably it will be used for us, uh, used uh, uh, by our uh, organized institute of government to, as uh, Sir Peter said, how to uh, find a node or uh, something, yes. So, in addition to that, scoping uh, the future is important. So emerging technology, this is quite important, AI and its utilization, general, uh, gene editing or so. But uh, because uh, these uh, may change the uh, game rule and also the uh, accelerate the speed of transmission, uh, transformation. And uh, agenda in the scope, but uh, not uh, highlighted in SDGs, Yesterday, uh, my boss Nakamura explained that uh, 
uh, individual country has its own priority, like in uh, Japan, aging society or declining uh, birth rate. And now in Japan, but uh, maybe in many countries beyond 2030. So, and also, uh, yesterday, Bill Colgrazi uh, emphasized on the uh, PWI 2050, uh, for example. So this is uh, Nakamura-san shows Japanese priority. Uh, it's a uh, uh, little different from the uh, SDG itself. Also, this is T TWI 2000. It's uh, from Naki-san. Uh, he uh, provided me for that. And uh, that is a six uh, uh, example of six uh, uh, transforms uh, uh, yes, described in TWI 2000 to 2050. So, I uh, was strongly inspired by uh, yesterday's uh, Dr. Sushi, Vladimir's uh, presentation, and uh, we have a very complex note. But probably road mapping, mapping current activities, identifying all the synergies, and scoping to make become <laughs> complex node become simpler. Finally, yes, uh, we are something like that. So still missing parts and piece. Not so much things to say, but uh, a lot to do still will be left. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Otake, uh, for also emphasizing the need to develop the infrastructure uh, to allow uh, evidence-based implementation of, of the SDGs, understand what gaps around uh, uh, the, the STI uh, system and what um, demands the SDG put on STI systems uh, nationally. We're going to move on to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Ernesto fernandez Polchuk, um, Chief of Section for Science Policy and Partnerships at the Natural Science Sector in UNESCO. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much. Um, I just first I would like to mention that I'm actually not Jackie McGlade, uh, <laughs> just as a clarification, and uh, that's also why I'm breaking the gender parity in the panel tonight, today, uh, replacing or at least sitting in for her. I cannot replace uh, Jackie. It's a pity we don't have her here, but uh, um, I'll do my best. Um, so. My, my presentation, it takes a little bit of a step back I, in terms of uh, trying to frame where Peters and, and uh, also uh, Otake-san's uh, presentation, uh, Nakamura-san from yesterday, get framed into the, the science advice and science policy system. So I wanted to, first of all, uh, remind everyone that our framework, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, is uh, turning 70 this year, and we're celebrating that anniversary, uh, in our case, with World Science Day. And that the Article 27 that we sometimes oversee uh, is about the right to share in scientific advancement and its benefits. So we, this is the framework in which I, I, I would like to like the, the very, very step back to see why we are actually doing this, yeah? And, and this year is particularly important in that sense. And then, uh, we, yeah, and invite everyone to celebrate uh, World Science Day for Peace and Development uh, uh, on Friday, because, well, on Saturday, actually. Um, then back to what uh, the, the um, Otake-san was saying about the, the goals and also the different graphics that were presented throughout the day and yesterday. So. The goals are universal, indivisible, indivisible, and integrated according to their own uh, uh, desc de description. However, uh, we've been uh, listening to how difficult to look into this, uh, this uh, mapping with, uh, with, uh, without trying to uh, find some uh, way to look partially into it. And in particularly, when, when we look at what, how UNESCO looks at the integration and the interconnection of the goals, we ourselves are involved in um, like 11, 
two, four, five, nine, yeah, 11, 12 uh, goals out of the 17. So as an organization, we are ourselves active in 12 of the 17 goals. So it's clearly that the interconnection is there and that we are in the center of that uh, interconnection. And I, I want to, um, in that sense, the, those that, do, that work in science in the, in the organization, we value very much this, this scheme because of the fact that I, I, I very much like this classification, so I'm, 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 this is uh, Flavia Schlegel's uh, idea about that the science is present in these SDGs and the agenda very explicitly, for instance, in uh, the um, SDG 9, that science is needed for the SDGs, as, as also Peter was explaining, and that the Agenda 2030 and the SDGs become a tool for promoting the importance of science because of this fact that uh, the science is so integrated. So suddenly uh, the, the global agenda is a tool to promote the importance of science, which was not so clear with the MDGs where science was like squarely around and we had to argue very, very long until we got to the point where we could say, okay, and therefore it's important to to do science. Uh, well, I'll skip this one. Then I will just very briefly mention this idea. It has been, I, I would say that almost every presentation uh, during this day and a half mentioned the word ecosystem. And like, when I look at the ecosystem, I look at something like this. I'm, I, I don't like the idea of ecosystem. So I want to kind of uh, uh, think about as, uh, go back to the systems, the systems uh, concept that we have been discussing for so many years from the, from the innovation systems uh, perspective and think about how the uh, science advice system, not ecosystem, trying not to eat each other, yeah, that there's not a trophic chain there, that we are actually working in a, in a complex system but not necessarily uh, eating each other. Uh, that, and start with this diagram, I don't know if you can see it, uh, uh, Sir Peter might recognize that uh, from uh, two years ago from the Brussels conference um, about the policy process and how science influences. Well, to make it clearer, it, it, it's not you're not supposed to see the details, so don't don't. Uh, it's it's just a reference to uh, to the the framework that I want to simplify in terms of saying okay, policy making and the relation to SDGs, and a bit like it was uh, said uh, earlier, like there are the SDGs, but are there are also the national development plans that have uh, the influence on the SDGs. On the other side, we have science and the scientific capacities, which are represented very strongly uh, in uh, uh, SDG 9, and particularly in, uh, the targets of SDG 9. I mean, one of the indicators in SDG 9 is the uh, gross expenditure in research and development. So it is science very strongly and the number of researchers uh, uh, per population. So science is very present there. Now, this is uh, basically a transcription of what Gianmarco was showing yesterday. We have, the, the, we have science, we have policy making, we have mechanisms, uh, you were getting them, but basically we have the mechanisms, we have the institutions, we have the people, different type of mechanisms that, pr that uh, give that uh, interface. Now, uh, to make it a little bit uh, around what we've been discussing uh, earlier in this session, there are the priorities. And I, th I see the uh, uh, Sir Peters and the, and the, the Japanese and, and the models say about the roadmaps as the two-way priority setting. The, the two-way priority setting. We have the priority setting that goes into the policy making and the priority, that's basically how I read uh, Sir Peters uh, in, 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 a, in a very nutshell or less. And the priorities that go from the SDG policy making to the science and the uh, system in the, in the roadmaps uh, approach. So somehow I, I, I think that uh, this interface is now also conceptually uh, uh, interfaced by the priorities in both directions. But uh, to this, I would like to add another component, and this is another SDG, uh, which is SDG 4. So, and, and in particularly for the uh, developing countries, because sometimes when we look at this system, and this is what, uh, what we've been looking at, it, it reflects countries where you actually have this, where you actually, where I don't know if this is uh, yeah, the point. 
where this is a thing. Because I, I would like to remind that if we don't have science, we don't have science advice, yeah? We don't have interface, we don't have anything. So uh, if, if, if we have a very a, a, a small science system, we, we, we're this, this uh, whole model is starting to, to make, uh, uh, to, to leak, not to get uh, water into it. So that's why I, I wanted to really stress the idea of SDG4 and the quality education, but not only in terms of feeding the scientific capacities, but also feeding with scientific culture into the policy making process so that there is actually questions uh, that are asked by the policy making com community or the policy making uh, or the governments to say it more straightforwardly. So if we don't have scientific culture, how can well, if, the, if, if the scientific culture is not sufficiently developed, why would the policy makers ask scientifically relevant questions? Yeah? So the, 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 the quality education in terms of, of, uh, of STEM education, and of scientific literature, uh, literacy, of informal education, of, uh, of the science museums, of the science journalism, of everything that is around science communication is, uh, is very, very important in this framework. So, I'm, I'm trying to link here a couple of SDGs around this idea uh, of policy making and to add to this uh, two, two more things. The normative framework, and I'll, I'll come back to this a little bit later, and something that was just brought uh, forward by uh, Otake-san, the monitoring. So thank you for that. Uh, um, and just briefly, I have 30 seconds left, but I will briefly go into some of the normative uh, aspects which I want to, the, last year UNESCO, the member states approved the recommendation on science and scientific researchers. And we see this as the normative framework globally. And if you look at this, the recommendation where member states talk to themselves, really, say that member states should establish and substantially strengthen human and institutional capacities, including by using scientific and technological knowledge in decision making and policies. Then there is an item on science diplomacy in a, in a uh, similar way. Then there is an item on creating the environment for, for the scientific researchers to give policy advice uh, in an accountable manner and with which in without conflict or with disclosing the conflicts of interest. This related to the discussion on the ethical guidelines on science advice. And then the last one is about the conditions of employment designed for scientific researchers benefiting from what we call here mobility, which is this, this moving from R&D to other public functions, including science advice, and that the career development prospects are still there, and, and Tateo San was asking yesterday, on the, uh, no, the day before at the, at, the, at the science diplomacy workshop about something in this direction. So uh, then just very briefly on the monitoring, and here I wanted to say that we, have, we are going to launch in, in three weeks time the GoSpin platform, which is an observatory of STI policy instruments, where the, the STI policy instruments of the countries will be also linked to the SDGs in a very similar uh, concept as uh, Otake-san was uh, mentioning about the projects in. So we're looking at what is being implemented by the Ministry of Science and Technology about uh, what policies are in place and how do they relate to SDGs. So uh, the roadmaps, I think it's, it's already uh, uh, done. So just very briefly to wrap up, again, consolidate the capacities, strengthen the systems, the monitoring, and here I want to just uh, tease uh, with uh, James is, is sitting there, tease the idea about a global atlas, so a monitoring also on how does this work in different countries, what are the experiences, how do these systems work in different countries, and then the priority setting, which is the discussion that, that the two colleagues uh, before me um, started. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ernesto. Um, your point about science being embedded in the, in the SDGs uh, is being needed in the implementation and um, providing actually an opportunity for, for profiling the importance of science is very important and the need to underlie that with um, education and um, NSDI capacities for an effective uh, science policy interface is very important. So we're going to move on to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Apolonia Miola from the joint, uh, European Commission Joint Research Center. She leads the GRC research projects on knowledge management for the Sustainable Development Goals.
Thank you. Um, I will give you a concrete example uh, of our activity on the supporting uh, policy uh, implementation for SDGs. Um, the JRC is the in-house scientific institution for the European Commission. So we work very close to the policy uh, cycle in the European Commission. And um, first of all, we need to define the political context uh, of our activity. In uh, 2016, the European Commission lay out the, uh, the communication which framed the context for the implementation of the Agenda 2030 in the European Union. And um, in practice, it has been defined in the governance. The European Commission adopted an holistic uh, approach and uh, without adopting a one single strategy for the SDGs implementation, it was decided to mainstream SDGs in any thematic policy or sectorial policy. Then measuring progress is one of the key elements of this um, political context. The uh, SDGs uh, indicator set for the European Union is the ESTAT uh, uh, um, commitment is the statistical officer of, of the European Union and then shared responsibility and multi-stakeholder platform has been established for the European Union involving academy, uh, private sector and the business sector. This is uh, the, the framework, the communication framing uh, the political context. Of course, we also have been engaged in the external policies for development in, uh, in any countries in the world. Um, the JRC is full committed in supporting the European Commission. In, uh, is in a combination of thematic expertise and competence. In this picture, you can see the, the, the results of our internal survey to identify the key projects uh, relevant for each single goal. So you will see that there are some goals that have more emphasis, such as goal number three, and less emphasis li like the one on equal uh, opportunity, I will say, <laughs> gender equality. But anyway, this is our framework. I will talk to you, uh, of course, we collaborate also for with the member states, with the United Nations and other uh, custodian agencies, for instance, for the indicators for SDGs, and with international uh, scientific networks, such as the one in charge for the, the World in 20 initiative. Um, I'm leading um, a research project, which is uh, building a knowledge base for SDGs implementation, whose main uh, objective is mainstreaming SDGs into European Union policies, identification of interlinkages, and building a European Commission community of practice on SDGs. Um, mainstreaming SDGs into policies. One year ago, I will have been asked to eat mapping, the, to run an exercise mapping all the European Union policies along the 17,169 targets. So it means that uh, we analyze the entire legislative body of the European Union, classifying all these uh, uh, policy actions along the 17 goals. Well, when we have been asked, um, our feeling was like this mouse in the picture. And um, it was really, the magnitude of the exercise was really big. It was, uh, um, so we involved 28 European Commission directorates, 200 policy experts, plus, of course, scientists, our colleagues. We, um, we analyzed 1,789 policy actions. It means that we developed a code, we coding the policy documents and the context, and then we coding the SDGs and targets. We set up the database, and then we asked to these 200 policy experts to review our database, and then classify the entire body along all these 17 goals. The is online, the results of this exercise, it was published one year ago, and uh, you can uh, push the button on one, select one single goal, and you can see the list of the policies relevant for that goal and the targets in that specific goal. Okay, 
So this, uh, this uh, matrix was created just one week ago, so it's uh, our ongoing activity, because our uh, colleagues in the policy DGs, they wanted to see in one single table the results of this analysis. So these are 169 rows and 169 um, columns, the targets. And in this uh, table, uh, we, uh, you can see just uh, the interactions. So just when we have uh, two or more policy in each single cell. So if we have just one policy relevant for that specific target, this is not included in this table. And, um, and in this way, we have identified the EU key policy nodes. It means that uh, if you want to transform the policy context, if you want to achieve the policy coherence for sustainable development goals, you have to um, act uh, simultaneously in uh, coordin in uh, you have to coordinate your action in EU in any policy domains. You have to consider any EU policy domains. This is uh, the perspective. You have to adopt a systemic approach. Each single cell include policy documents. I mean, you can push the button and select the cell and see the, uh, the list of the policy. This exercise has been uh, uh, combined with another exercise that we are now carrying out. We are analyzing uh, the, the current uh, uh, literature on the P and the green literature on interlinkages. And um, this is the visualization of our internal database as uh, a tool to visualize the accumulated interlinkages from a set of publications. We are now doing a meta-analysis of these main studies on interlinkages. We are trying to understand if there are agreement on uh, the interlinkages, because as you know, the implementation is context dependent. Most of this publication depends on the, the country of the scientist that published these results. If you select, you can see the, um, select the targets or the goal, you can see the, in this case, the synergies for the goal number seven or the trade-off. I mean, is there really, because uh, we work with the policy makers, you need to use tool to attract their attention and to translate in, uh, in a simple way very complex uh, uh, issue. And then again, we combine the results of this analysis of the literature on interlinkages with the, ma the mapping of EU policy action. In this network, you will see uh, the, the green are on the synergies and the, the red are uh, the, the trade-off. The network, the interlinkages are based on the literature. In any um, goal, you will see the list, if you push the button, you will uh, read the list of the policies that have been mapped in our e, uh, previous task. Uh, the next step of this exercise will be the analysis of the impact assessment carried out for each single policy to identify some criteria for, to, uh, for the next step, which will be the definition of SDG's impact assessment for any new policy initiative in the European Commission. So this is really about uh, the policy coherence for SDGs. It looks uh, complex, but um, maybe no. It depends on the, on the day, it depends on jet lag, maybe. So just to summarize uh, um, the, the actions that have been carried out, the, the green blocks are on science and the, the blue blocks are on the policy, uh, uh, the policy side. Uh, we have been asked to carry out the gap analysis, the interlinkages, the integrated assessment and monitoring implementation policies. This was the main request coming from the policy makers working on SDGs. In order for them, this is very important, these uh, requests are important because they need these inputs to set the policy priorities and then also to align the budget decision uh, with the SDGs context. For instance, for the European Commission, there are now a discussion on the multi-annual financial framework for the next uh, five years to align any decision with the SDGs. There is an exercise on the taxonomy of the sustainable finance of the European Commission, relevant also for the SDGs. Finally, 
when we, uh, we have set up this uh, internal uh, community of practice on SDGs. In practice, when we started this as ex exercise to mainstream SDGs in all the EU policies, we identified the key actors in any directorate in, our, in the European Commission working for SDGs. We built this community of practice, and the, the GRC is the facilitator of this community of practice whose main objective is sharing knowledge, sharing practice in the European Commission for all the officials in order to avoid duplication in our institution and to have synergies in sharing knowledge. This is uh, a very concrete example. Well, if you have any questions, you can email me. Thank you very much, Apollonia. Uh, this kind of stock-taking um, exercise is actually very useful in, in showing the breadth of the, of the agenda, but also in, in providing some building, building blocks for, for conversation on what, what policy, policy coherence means. So very in, important. Um, so next and final speaker, um, Professor Remy Kirian, who has already been introduced this morning as the Chief Scientist of Quebec and President of the Board of Three um, di Directors uh, the Fonds de Recherche du Québec. Um, Rémi, you have the floor. Good, so um, as uh, the last uh, speaker in the session, uh, one day and a half of discussion all these uh, fancy uh, analyses, uh, I decided to take a different, uh, different stand, different approach. I, uh, I really enjoy uh, uh, the presentation of all the speakers, learn a lot. What uh, Peter uh, presented uh, first in the session, the, the work that Jim is doing with the colleague, with Ernesto at UNESCO, uh, it's fabulous, of course, the Japanese colleague, uh, the, the activity is uh, just, uh, just amazing. But uh, maybe I say, well, to bring something a bit different, maybe I need to be a little bit uh, provocative. And I will be on a couple, couple of front. Of course, this is very ambitious as an agenda. Everyone, everyone said, said that uh, 2030 is... Uh, almost, uh, almost uh, next week, but, but we cannot uh, really fail. Will we succeed on all of them? Likely not. But as uh, I think as Madam Clark mentioned earlier, this now we have direction, we have, uh, we have some kind of, of a vision. But I would argue that success very much depend on not leaving all the activity to international organization, or even to national elected official. It needs to move down to the ground, to the civil society, to community, to city. They need to understand what could that mean for them, not just for the elected official for the next four or five years. So, and there is a major challenge there, how to bring them on board. Because it's, a, it's quite a bit abstract when we are discussing that and showing this type, this type of picture. So I think we probably need to think about that, and we, we have been thinking about that already, but we need to go further on that and really try to embrace the kind of famous act local but think global. Much easier said than done. We, we all understand that very well. But to be able to succeed there, yes, we need scientists of all shape and form. But I would say the type of scientists that we need most are social scientists, artists, ethicists. So we need to change the paradigm quite a bit, quite a bit there. And it really, that's my first big uh, kind of point. Changing somehow the mindset almost all over the world, 
bringing the community on board and social scientists are already involved, but they should be much more involved and it could help us quite a bit. Second part of my comments, then here I'll be very narrow and focus on very few SDG and from maybe bringing a little bit of a Canadian regional municipal type of perspective. First one, gender equality. We have not heard too, too much about this one here at the meeting. I will argue that success depends very much on that one. If we leave 50% of society behind or not involved, we will hardly make any progress. And gender equality, of course, is key to address poverty, hunger, quality education, etc., etc. Of course, in Canada, Prime Minister Trudeau is talking about gender equality, not only in Canada, but all over the world. So there's still a lot of work to do there, but certainly it's on the agenda for us in Canada, in Quebec, and in the province. So we are aiming to have 50, 50 percent representation on various type of organization. We have made progress where we have not made that much progress is in the private sector. So we still need a lot of effort there to make sure that there is more link, more buy-in uh, from the private sector in terms of gender equality, gender diversity. We also need to adapt our strategy with local community. And we have many different local community, for example, in the north. The culture of the Inuit is very different from the culture of a citizen in Montreal. So we need to adapt that quite a bit. SDG number nine, infrastructure, industry. So here I will add kind of a fourth I, intelligence. And these days, AI. Artificial intelligence. You may think that in Canada, we have strong infrastructure, strong industry. Well, not that much. So the current government at the federal level created what we call super cluster in various niche area, very large project that go from basic science to applied science to civil society. And I think we need to evolve in that direction. Uh, in Quebec as well, we are not there yet, but we are optimistic that with artificial intelligence, we may have some help. Such a transversal type of, uh, of activity, the new digital world. But the key here again, and it was discussed at the meeting here, to make sure that no one is left behind. The poor the new immigrants, the age, the indigenous community of the North. So that's also very critical in the context of artificial intelligence and what it could mean, artificial intelligence, for society. We are building with the ground something known as Déclaration de Montréal, and here, there it would be the focus of the social impact of the digital economy of artificial intelligence on all members of society. Social scientists, ethicists will have a critical role on that one. We'll launch that on December the 3rd in Montreal. Sustainable cities and community, SDG 11. I already mentioned a little bit that we need to have buy-in from cities, from municipalities, from local communities. The world population is more and more concentrated in large cities. Wealth 
is often concentrated in large city, but poverty as well. And it creates a lot of tension between in local community. Natural disasters often have much larger impact in cities. Cities are responsible for about 70% of the green, greenhouse gases. Health and nutrition related issues, such as food security, often much more present in city. So it's clear that SDG 11, Sustainable City, is at the nexus of many of the SDG. And that local government and community must be given resources and authorities to be able to fulfill the aspiration of their citizen. So more and more we see that action is moving at the more municipal and city level. Finally, climate, climate action. It seems that, that the more urgent it is, the less we do about it. So we need to act very, very forcefully on our front globally, nationally, and locally. But here again, the, the citizen, civil society need to understand a bit better and take ownership of that goal. Otherwise, and then if they take ownership of the goal, then they put pressure on the elected official to change things. Otherwise, probably, I'm not optimistic that that uh, will make major, major advance over the next few years. And here again, on climate change, women have a critical role in all countries. In the Inuit community, for example, they are the one that basically cook. They are the one using wood. They are the one using petroleum. They are the one using various types of gases. So we need to change that. We need to offer alternative to these communities. We're trying to do that, but action is slow. Canada, a bit paradoxical, but it shows again what I was saying in my uh, talk this morning. When you have political leader, you have various elements to consider. The eastern part of Canada, lucky. We have cheap power, great clean energy and all that. Western part of Canada, they want to sell their oil to Asia. So the government, the Canadian government, just bought a pipeline to bring petroleum from Alberta, the province of Alberta, to British Columbia so we can export this petroleum. But of course, that generates a large amount of greenhouse, greenhouse gas. So the eastern side of the country is upset at the western side of the country. And if we continue in that direction, of course, we'll miss our target. And we are not the only one. On that, on that front. Climate change, last word, largest impact, I would argue, is in the Arctic. And there, we need to work all together. There is positive aspect of it, because of course you can grow to agriculture in the North, things that you were not able to do before, but there's so many negative sides, and Canada, cannot do that alone. So we need to do, to work with other country. And there, I would argue that we can learn a lot by working with African country. A bit counterintuitive, but there is a lot of interesting cooperation we could do with desertification and what's happening in the North, the impact of climate change on frozen Venezuela. So, so I think there is, and also on that one, of course, climate change, very much and involve a lot of interaction with the other goal. So we need to, to act and act quickly. So in closing, local action, critical if you want to succeed, otherwise not very optimistic that things, concrete action will be taken uh, and that we'll be able to reach the objective of the SDG. Thank you very much, Rémy. So a number of uh, SDGs actually set a number of preconditions for achieving others. The, the point on inclusivity and the importance of gender equality, the, the importance of the climate change uh, SDG to um, 
to achieve the others and the point about localizing the agenda, developing ownership. Actually, the UN, uh, the HLBF, uh, New York uh, presented their, their SDG plan. Uh, it was the first time we, we saw that. So hopefully we're going to see local governments alongside national governments more and more in, in terms of the reporting um, internationally. So we, we're now opening for your questions, comments, uh, views, your, your own uh, experience uh, and, and views on, the, on, on this question. Um, the floor is open and I think there's mics in the, in the room. Mm -hmm. We'll start here. Um, I'm Sujatha Raman from the Center for Public Awareness of Science at the Australian National University. Um, my question is a reflection on the complexity uh, of the interactions that we heard a lot of. Um, and also we saw the complexities captured in, in a number of very impressive uh, graphics, images, um, tables, uh, and so forth. Uh, and I'm just wondering, um, that was ter terrific to see, but I'm just wondering if we need to um, think about uh, the issue that also came up in the panel as well as a little bit yesterday, I think, from Helen Clark's um, uh, presentation uh, about uh, priorities, about um, a kind of science of simplification, if you like. Are there ways in which some of these very complex interactions uh, can be uh, translated into, can be distilled down uh, synthesized uh, to something that is not simple, not simplistic, um, but much more simplified in some ways. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take a second one. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Michiko Izuka. I am from GRIPS. Uh, um, I would maybe, uh, after hearing the complexity, it's quite impressive, but I would like to take a step back and talking about SDGs and indicators. Uh, as um, uh, several uh, speakers talked about, uh, there is uh, 232 indicators, and I happened to look at all of them, and I found that only 60 and 17 of them are addressed directly to the science, technology, and innovation. And most of them are talking about R&D expenditures, or ICTs, or systems, or capacity buildings. And uh, when we talk about how important science would be in completing the, the SDGs, is there anything this community would like to say to the United Nations in terms of understanding or uh, suggesting uh, some of the indicators that can be uh, more uh, tangible for the implementers' uh, point of view? And I, I think that uh, one of the speakers from the uh, European Union uh, talked about that you have uh, some kind of indicators, and I would like to hear more about that. Thank you. Thank you. Who would like to respond? Well, let me start on the simplification. That's the whole point of the ISC INCSA thing, is to reduce it to a manageable number of interactions weighted appropriately to the context of the country and linked to the national prioritization process. The whole point of the exercise, and it's actually done in partnership with the JRC and IGES and IASA and others, all those other more complex things you've seen are actually going to feed into the project. So it's, they're not independent exercises. Uh, it, the whole point of the project is to reduce it to a tool that can be used in two ways. One, to force, force if you like, an interaction between the evidence community, civil society, on policy, on what matters. And secondly, so that the policy maker can link it to national priorities so they can see where they can get achieved what they like, what they want to achieve. The th the and if I could link it to the second question, the other point that matters is countries are overwhelmed by the indicators. Now, in fact, the indicators do not have the same official status as the targets do within the SDGs. They were, they were formed in a different way. And th they are clearly not necessarily the right set of indicators. And for s LMICs in particular, they're overwhelming. Even for massive, for big countries, they're overwhelming. I mean, I've had the statistic, the, you know, in a country like Samoa, yeah. there are two or three people in their statistical agency. They're not going to deal with all of those when they've got other issues to deal with. And so one of the points of the interaction analysis, which I didn't discuss, 
is actually to identify some key indicators which might directly or indirectly indicate progress on what, what could be achieved. And that's actually a very important point, because the indicator side of this is more overwhelming in a way than the list of targets and goals, because it actually requires action at the level of, of, of countries that actually are a long way sometimes from having even the infrastructure to get the data that's needed. Okay, with regard to the complexity, I will say that uh, you, you cannot base the setting priority just on identification of interlinkages. Of course, you need also to identify the gaps. And then you have to combine these, the gaps identified with the analysis of interlinkages. Because if you want to solve the gaps, then you have to also consider the interactions with other policy that can uh, help you in uh, uh, cover these gaps or can also exacerbate the, the problems in achieving them. To regard to the indicators, um, um, you know, the also the identification of indicators is context dependent because of the global uh, the data coverage and many other issues because uh, the ownership of the achievement of the Agenda 2030 is to the national uh, government, it's not to the United Nations. So any single uh, uh, nation is uh, trying to uh, identify the most appropriate set of indicators, which can be the United Nations official indicators. In, our, in the European Commission, we have the ESTAT framework okay. to monitor. We, uh, the ESTAT uh, is uh, the uh, statistical uh, institution has identified 100 indicators for to monitor the progress for the achievement of SDGs. Some of these indicators are in common with the United Nations, some others are really relevant for the, for the European Union context. This is Joe. So, thank you very much. And uh, regarding simp Simplify, first of all, yes, as you s mentioned, it's uh, very complicated. But uh, always everything decided by the SDG, but uh, multiple uh, versus national priorities. So national priority probably uh, we have uh, some certain level of criteria to simplify. As I mentioned, in for Japan, uh, yes, uh, aging society is uh, quite uh, important issue, but it is not uh, on the SDGs. So how can we? Uh, make things uh, 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 come to reality to Japan is that to think about it, uh, and uh, that is the first thing. Second thing is that, uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, already scientists, or even uh, not only science, but uh, a lot of uh, uh, practitioners uh, have been doing some uh, something for the time being. So looking at this kind of thing, and uh, looking at the SDG, and looking at the uh, national uh, policy, probably, uh, and also referring the uh, NOD study of uh, Xings or so, probably every uh, government, every uh, policy, policy maker in the uh, country uh, can find much simpler uh, implication for this kind of thing. This is uh, not automatically done from the computer. That is a quite, quite, uh, a quite important point of the uh, policy making. And second point, indicators. Yes, sir. as you mentioned, in Japan, uh, unfortunately, not so much a, a connection with the statistics uh, department and the research. That's unfortunate. But, but that what I would like to say is that, uh, as I mentioned, uh, using existing statistics, not on uh, not all of the 2000, uh, 232 indicators are covered. So, as JLC uh, uh, mentioned, that uh, we are not uh, uh, tend to think that these 232 is uh, definitely given, but we have to develop uh, something. Uh, more adequate or suitable to uh, monitor uh, SDG achievement, probably it also in, uh, depend on the individual countries uh, or society situation. So a uh, proposal can be uh, welcome probably in the world of society, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, just to add to that, uh, at the UNESCO Institute for Statistics, we, my colleagues are working on a set of indicators for STI for SDGs. So, which is adding to the 232, so it, it <laughs> won't be covered by Samoa probably, but for those countries who might want to look into that, uh, we are establishing a, another set of related indicators that are not part of the official 232 that will deal with this uh, relation between STI and SDG. So I invite you uh, to visit the, the UIS, the UNESCO Institute for Statistics, their website, and uh, uh, the, the document will be up for comments uh, pretty soon. So I, I don't have the date. But yep. Thank you. Yes, I had one little thing, again, <coughs> to be a bit uh, provocative and to follow on your, uh, on your question. Uh, before it's really is too broadly <coughs> in the world, in a sense, uh, we must try to simplify. Not oversimplify, but simplify. Because if we start by saying 230 something and all that, the elected officials don't, don't like these things, at least in my, in my part of the world. Thank you. We'll take more questions. I think we had uh, several hands. One more time. Uh, Jan Mark Müller, IASA. Well, the European Commission is a very interesting animal. On the one hand, <laughs> we have this European Commission in a political sense, so Mr. Juncker and his commissioners, so that's the Commission in a technical sense, and then we have the Commission is in an institutional sense, that is big public administration. What I found very interesting is what we see from your presentation, Apollonia, that there's a hell of activities going on in this public administration committed to the SDG, pushing forward and all developing all these activities, but then you have the European Commission in a political sense which is not seen as showing political leadership on the SDGs, if I'm phrasing it carefully. Which is actually very nicely showing this difference between policy and politics. So I'm wondering, um, considering that the European Commission will be elected next year, so what would need to happen that it does not only show policy leadership but also political leadership? Thank you. I think there was an other question behind. Uh, yes, hi, Carl from the Academy of Sciences, Malaysia. Um, just to build up on that question earlier, considering that um, structures that policy make um, that some of us in the policy advisory field um, propose to politicians of the day tend to be um, I w not that everlasting, meaning that it changes with every election cycle. Does legislation play a more important role in addressing the SDGs or to ensure that policies and initiatives that address the SDGs have some form of continuity? especially with the short time frame that we have in achieving these SDG goals. So that's my question to the panel. Thank you. Who would like to respond? Well, just on the last point, governments may set legislation, but, you know, like the British Climate Change Commission and New Zealand's going to do something similar about a, a goal for you know, zero carbon in 2050 or something. But I think you've got to be more realistic, and I think one of the issues here is the SDGs are so broad that any action a government does is probably in some way mappable to some SDG. And there, and there, and there, and that's the whole point of the INGSA ISD project, is to try and make it more likely to have direct pull on governments. I, I don't want to go into details, but the numerous governments will say to you, well, the SDGs are for LMICs, they're not for us even though they're for everybody else. And what they will do is cynic, somewhat cynically get an official to remap current policy to say it's meeting the SDG targets, as opposed to actually saying, well, actually, there's some challenges in these targets which we need to take into account in thinking about future policy. Now, it's not all or none, because they can pick and choose the bits of it that they like, what, depending on their political framing. So, you know... We can't be naive here. There is always going to be a policy political process around what governments choose to prioritise. I think the issue is to, for people to understand, as Helen Clark said yesterday, this is the only framing we have and it's the only likely framing we're going to have for a number of years in terms of the need to, to reflect both human and planetary sustainability. Now, it requires lots of actions, but one of them is 
uh, some of the discussion that was in the previous panel this morning about citizen action, but it certainly requires policy action. And what we're trying to do in this is force, not force, but encourage the policy maker to see that it can be value of them within their ordinary business of government to take that framing. Because, and that's certainly how some finance ministers have responded to the discussions I've had with them. I think in term, I can't, in a, in a sense, without getting at your question, because I can't comment on the EU, uh, 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 Jan Marco, I think this question of whether the SDGs have been taken cynically or seriously <laughs> is a fundamental issue when it comes to the policy political divide. Okay, just one thing. Um, on the European Union, um, sustainable development is in the European Union Treaty. SDGs is just part of the sustainable development paradigm. And on my personal point of view, nobody can stop this process. Even if in 2030 nobody will achieve these 17 goals, sustainable development is still on the table. As this process started many years ago. So also Trump cannot stop climate change, even if he wants. This is my personal point. <laughs> so, uh, think about the birth of SDG. Probably, uh, it's not the really convention treaty. So, and uh, as uh, Sir Peter said, it's a, a rather holistic, vague, uh, and uh, broad. Probably, the reaction to SDG, as uh, Sir Peter mentioned, it's uh, varied in uh, methodology as well as the probably depend on the country situation. In some case, it is necessary to have uh, set up the such kind of legislation to, to uh, regulate or uh, something is important. But, for example, as I mentioned, uh, if we would like to ask scientists to do something, first uh, thing we have to do is that the changing their mindset, that uh, it, it's not discussing about policy for science, but science for policy, or science for society. So in this regard, probably the, a lot of way of uh, reacting to SDGs is necessary. Uh, and uh, of course, I'm not uh, denying the legislation so, but that it's not the only way to do that. And much more difficult uh, uh, things around. And uh, you can Im imagine that the uh, title of SDG as a uh, UN uh, resolution is that transforming our world, transformation. The, the other thing is we must think broadly within the SDG framework. I mean, if you take, for many countries, SDG 16 is actually the core SDG. The institutions of government, governments need to be established. And while it's easy to talk about it in many developed countries, in many other countries, the social science of how one would develop the institutions of governance at every level, legal, uh, political, et cetera, et cetera, is the core issue. And I think that we need to therefore, within this, and uh, that's why I applaud Remy's comments about social science within this conversation, that, uh, that the, that and, and one of the things we need to do and this is again where the ISCN project started to think about this, is why we've talked about creating new dummy targets appropriate to individual countries to actually focus on some of the issues that really matter. Because the SDGs are written in one way, but when you actually analyse what might be needed in country X, it may actually mean that SDG 16 or some other SDG is actually the fundamental underlying basis for making real progress. And so there's a lot in this that actually, if you like, the SDGs are, are licensed to talk. They're not, a, 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 and they need to be turned into a license to talk, to affect policy at every level that leads to action. <coughs> and, and, and that is the, the key issue in many countries is getting to that point, even in developed countries. Any more comments from Remy? Okay, uh, I think we have, we're have. we taking one last question and then we, we need to close. Uh, I think the last question was a great segue probably to the panel after lunch because I think where governments fail to play their role, can the private sector and the corporate sector step in? And uh, not that I'm making a plug for my own session, 
But I think uh, Grameen, which I represent, probably is a great model of showing how a private entity can pick up a problem of poverty and then change it into an economic opportunity. So while you know, I'm chair of Grameen with 30 million women clients in India, we have globally about a trillion dollars of impact investing. Uh, and whether it's Japan this morning in meetings with, with the private wealth and, and venture funds who are saying, how do we get into this? Uh, and realizing, therefore, the SDG is a license to act for corporates, uh, to Peter's point, where do we make that bridge between license to talk and license to act, and can the markets really be uh, that momentum behind license to act? And I think it's clear that a number of major corporations in many countries are actually responding by actually having true sustainability agendas linked to the SDGs. Now, they have, may have mixed reasons for doing it, but nevertheless, they're showing quite a lot of leadership, uh, and major companies are setting up boards, independent boards, to make themselves accountable to the SDGs. So I think, the, I think your point is well made. Thank you. So our time is up, so I'll uh, join me in thanking the panel.